here we are. All right. Well, hey, hi, um, I'm Becky Margiata, and I have Selena Lou Raphael with the Billions Institute here with me and Jennifer Blatz from Strive Together, the CEO. Hi, everybody, and thank you for joining us today. Um, Strive Together and the Billions Institute, we're really excited to be doing this. So here's this emerged organically in a conversation we've been doing half hour free free consults with any organization who's in the it just who's in the midst of 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 scaling or of recalibrating and uh in different ways and we ended up talking with some of jennifer's colleagues at uh, strive together and just started brainstorming of what could we do and this emerged out of this so i'm excited to be doing it uh again and again and again my thoughts have gone to this is a unique moment for systems change. And I've heard from all kinds of sectors, people in telemedicine who said uh, in the National Health Service in England saying things we thought would take us 10 years, took us 10 days. So um, Jennifer is uniquely, uniquely poised um, to be able to share with us what she's seeing as her vantage point. But before we go too far down this road, I wanna just do, do her right by introducing her and re reading her official bio so we can all know where Jennifer's coming from. So um, she is the president and CEO of Strive Together, which is a national nonprofit. And this nonprofit works in 70 communities in the United States. And it's all about enabling 13 million young people to succeed in school and in life. I think you all have the cradle to career is kind of the, the, the catchphrase. Um, she's a nationally recognized leader and expert in building place-based partnerships. And for 20 years now, she's been designing, developing, and implementing strategies that drive large-scale community improvement. Um, when she was um, a young girl, she wanted to be a teacher. Um, so clearly a love of children, um, a love of community, um, and she's had many, many leadership roles um, um, uh, in, in her career. Uh, her whole official bio is on the Strive Together website. Um, I got to meet Jennifer through uh, when she came through the Skid Row School, one of the earlier, in the earlier years, several years ago. And we've had the pleasure of knowing her and some of her colleagues. Um, we've interviewed uh, Parv, her colleague, on the uh, on our Unleashing Social Change podcast. And uh, Selena can put that in the chat if people want to hear even more about Strive's amazing work. Um, and you are sitting in a perch where you're connected with 70 local systems change efforts that were ongoing before even this. So uh, we're, let's, with no further ado, Jennifer, thank you for being here today. Thank you, Becky. I am, I'm really excited about being here with you today. And I just want to say before we get started that um, I've taken so much from the Billions Institute and my experience at the Skid Row School. And one of the first things I did um, in sort of kind of thinking about this crisis and sending out a note to our team, I thought immediately of, okay, we're going to have to weather a crisis. We're going to have to work in a different way. We're going to have to make some pivots. What's the best way that we can help um, make sure that team members have the resources they need? And I thought immediately about tapping into your genius and uh, pulled uh, some tools from Billions Institute and shared them with the team. Um, because I do think what you just noted, that people are doing amazing things and really tapping into their genius very quickly to be able to respond to the crisis we're facing. And I've seen that happen across um, our, our organization, our team, as well as a across the, the Cradle to Career Network. And so I'm excited to be here with you to talk a little bit more about that today. Wonderful, wonderful. Well, what a treat. And um, just want to let folks know, you can use the chat to chat in questions as we go. We want this to be really interactive. We have a few questions to get the ball rolling. Um, or uh, you can use and, and or you can use, there's a Q&A. If you look down on the bottom of your webinar screen there, there's both the chat and the Q&A. And Selena's gonna back, bounce back and forth between the two of those. It'll be fine. Um, and uh, so with no further ado, let's jump in. So for people who aren't as familiar and haven't been kind of strive together groupies since the Stanford Social Innovation Review article on Collective Impact came out. Jennifer, can you tell us just a little bit about Strive Together's mission and purpose, what you all really do in the world in 
the, the least jargony terms possible? <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's a challenge. No, um, it, no thank you uh, for, for this opportunity to talk more about Strive Together. So Strive Together is a national movement um, with a very clear purpose that I think probably resonates with everyone in, uh, on today's call, which is uh, that we really believe that every child, regardless of race, ethnicity, zip code, or circumstance, should have every opportunity to thrive and reach their full potential. And so this national movement, as you mentioned, we have a national network of nearly 70 communities who are supporting uh, more than 12 million children uh, annually, and more than half of, have the, of those children are children of color to really break down system, systemic barriers so that we can see more equitable results and equitable outcomes for those children and families. So the goal is really putting children and families on a path toward mobility and we do that through transforming systems. That's great. And so, and when you say that, you're not limiting yourself to, like, say, the public education system in the area. It goes, who are, who are the usual suspects that might great. be around, that come around the table, right? Yeah. Great question. So while we measure our, the outcomes we measure are cradle to career outcomes, so starting at kindergarten readiness up through employment, but really the work that we're doing is happens in multiple systems in multiple sectors. So we're talking about education, health, housing, transportation, uh, justice, human services. Um, and so all of these systems really have to come together and work in an integrated way in order to produce uh, equitable outcomes for children and, and, and to really see a reduction and elimination of disparities across those seven cradle to career outcome areas that we measure as a network. And, and cradle to career outcomes, is it stuff like a third grade reading levels? Yeah. And yep. this, like, what are, what are the gold yeah. standard uh, yeah. touch points of what we should all be in our communities keeping an eye, yeah. keeping an eye on? Yeah, so starting with kindergarten readiness, and actually we're really looking at um, much earlier than kindergarten. So we've spent a lot of time, although we our first outcome area that all network members measure is kindergarten readiness, I'd say we've been spending more time with prenatal to three outcomes as well. So kindergarten readiness, then you have grade level reading, so reading at grade level by third grade. You have eighth grade math or middle grade math, which is a key milestone um, that can predict success um, in life. Then you have high school graduation, of course, post-secondary enrollment, post-secondary completion, and then employment. And you've been working with communities long enough that you've seen people grow up all the way through that start from, or, or I'm, I'm assuming, go all the way through that, that, uh, that shoots and ladders game. <laughs> yeah, well, so we've been at this work. So you mentioned the uh, collective impact article. Um, uh, I got my start uh, working with the Strive Local Partnership, which was the, the uh, collective impact partnership that was featured in that article back in 2006. And so um, we've been doing this work for more than a decade. Um, certainly there are populations of, of children who have, who have come up uh, through systems during that time, but in each of our partnerships across our, our network of, of nearly 70, really they're looking at where they use data to, to identify identify where are the key target populations that, uh, that they need to focus on in their particular community and really are focused on target populations across that cradle to career continuum and the myriad systems that uh, have to work together in order to improve outcomes across uh, each of those, uh, those indicators. Got it. And, the, and I'm assuming those target, the populations would be those that are furthest situated from opportunity in some way in that community. It's so it's, it's unique yeah. and bespoke to each community. It is. It is the national network. So we're um, the the communities in the network run the gamut from um, urban communities, more uh, um, in large metropolitan cities like uh, Chicago, all the way to uh, we have a partnership that's multi-county um, based out of Berea, Kentucky, so eastern Kentucky, so rural communities. And so the target populations in communities do look different based on those uh, the the uh, context of the local community, uh, but certainly it is uh, prioritizing communities of color, children of color, and uh, children and families experiencing poverty. 
Got it. Got it. By the way, shout out to Barrio. After I graduated from college, my parents moved to Richmond and <gasps> we used to have to drive by Berea and that is a, um, a, 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 a town to watch. Yes. For sure, right? They're really it, doing some neat stuff. It is. Partners for Education is the partnership there um, that's uh, based in out of Berea. But like I said, it's a multi-county, uh, rural, promise neighborhood. And it's really shaping how we think about uh, the work that we're doing in communities, to in rural communities across the country. So Jerima Gentry, who leads that partnership, is uh, one of my heroes and is just a really great, uh, great systems leader in this work. Wonderful. Wonderful. Thank you, Jennifer. Okay. So for everyone who's listening, Jennifer and her people, you're all the people you know and love and have known for years, they've got their hands in every cookie jar of systems change imaginable. And if like me, you are uh, thoroughly distraught by what is happening in the world, both on an emotional toll, but also just... Um, uh, just beside myself at the incompetence I'm seeing at the at the federal level, this is like one of the few things that gives me hope and the, the possibility of uh, communities, locally communities coming together in different ways and forging things. And so um, one of the best ways that uh, change can spread is through, Dan, he talks about bright spots of, and I will tell you, let me just do a quick timeout because when I was working on homelessness, Phoenix, Arizona could house anybody anywhere 10 days or less, period, boom, done. Veterans, like done, 10 days, they're like, got it. And I knew Phoenix could house people in 10 days or less. And most cities that I worked with could house veterans in nine months or more. And uh, one of the most vexing challenges for me in that leading large scale change was to um, cut and paste what Phoenix was doing to other communities and it's it has to be adapted you can't copy it but we did web web webinars we did zoom calls and uh it took more to budge that you know it took getting people in the room together but at the very least hearing what the bright spots are gives all of us hope and all of us pop, and it's social referencing so we can be like berea kentucky did it you know and so or like we can be like even better we could be not even better it depends on who your comparative other, right? Like, so for example, also I worked on homelessness. I noticed cities had reference cities. So mm -hmm. Portland would be like, well, what's Santa Monica doing, right? And so people wanted to know the, what other cities who think they're like them are doing. So I'm hoping you can take us across a range of small, medium, large cities, across a range of sectors. But let me just, this is not easy work, but the bright spots sure help. So what are you seeing? Yeah, no, absolutely. You're right. What you've described, uh, Becky, is what we like to call the network effect. And so we're really looking at how do we share across a network of communities. And there certainly are, it does benefit to get uh, communities together with like-sized communities who might be experiencing um, similar uh, situations in the, uh, throughout this crisis. But certainly we see just as many um, uh, communities learning from uh, Partners for Education in Berea, whom I mentioned to Thrive Chicago and Dallas. Um, and I think what I'm, what we're seeing the most, uh, I mean, it, it runs the gamut. And so I'm, I'm actually trying to do uh, what I'm trying to do right now has been to talk with each of our network members individually. And I think we've hit more than half of the, the network of nearly 70 over the last few weeks to really understand some of the stories that they're uh, seeing on the ground. And some of the common key themes that we see across communities are issues that, as you uh, referenced, um, while not surprising to us, it just infuriating when you think of the systemic inequities that we knew existed in, in communities are just being magnified that much more. And so we're seeing this sort of resolve across communities to not return to normal, not return to the status quo. And I, I, I was thinking about this this weekend because unfortunately I spent uh, more time than I'd like uh, looking at um, social media and constantly I hear my friends on social media or you hear it in the news as well. Like, I want to return to normal. Like what, you know, I can't wait to get back to normal. And for us, normal, for people like me, my family, normal is pretty comfortable. It's, it's very comfortable. It's, it's good. Normal for the majority of Americans is not 
good. So what we're seeing in communities across our network is this resolve about not returning to the status quo, creating a new normal, and really what that looks like is transforming systems in a way that we've not transformed them in the past. That we've, you know, if, if I know at, at Billions, um, uh, you shared the, we share a lot of the same DNA uh, around continuous quality improvement and the idea that every system is perfectly designed to get the results it gets. And so what we're seeing right now in communities is um, systems designed to get really bad results. And so across the network, we see our partnerships looking at how do we not return to the status quo and how do we use this moment to create more equitable and inclusive policy at the local, state, and national levels. And um, for us, also in our DNA, and I know we share this with Billions, is uh, using data to drive improvement. And so what we see a number of our partnerships doing in places like the Commit Partnership in Dallas, Texas, um, uh, Northfield Promise in Northfield, Minnesota, um, uh, Rocky Mountain Cradle to Career Partnership in um, Adams County, Colorado. Uh, across the network, we see partnerships using data, and they're they're using the data that they can really quickly gather and the capacity they have to use data to create heat maps to show where is the digital divide um, and to show where are where are the most immediate needs as it relates to food security, and then really having strategic conversations not only about how to get um, get the more downstream uh, immediate needs um, uh, solved for, but, but referring to Dan Heath and his new book around upstream, these conversations that these partnerships are having with local community stakeholders is how do we transform systems so that they are more equitable uh, going forward. And so an example um, that our, our partnership in, in uh, Dallas County, uh, the Commit Partnership shared is they're using those heat maps on the digital divide to have conversations not only with superintendents about how to improve uh, online learning and healthcare pro providers to really think about how are you making sure that you are delivering uh, telehealth right now, but also local clergy because church is being delivered online. So you're looking at these multiple stakeholder groups who have an interest in making sure that we have more equitable access to uh, things like broadband internet services. And that's something we can easily do. And that's something that should be a no brainer. So it's those kind of examples. Um, I'll share a few more examples um, very quickly. Uh, but um, another example that comes to mind as, as a bright spot is our Promise partnerships in Salt Lake. And as you were talking about housing and all of the work that you did as it relates to homelessness, I know that you agree that even outside of a pandemic, um, housing stabi stability is health care is, is equals health. And now in a pandemic, when we're being told to shelter in place, it's a clear to everyone that housing stability is, equals health care, equals uh, access to health. And so um, in the Promise Partnerships of Salt Lake, they have been working with a lot of the um, rent assistance agencies and, and working to uh, bring them together with city and county officials to make sure that, um, that rent assistance is accessible by the populations that need them the most. And really in that community, they're thinking about undocumented residents who wouldn't necessarily have access uh, to the benefits that are available to them during this time. The same types of uh, uh, conversations are happening in, in Shelby County, uh, Memphis, Memphis, Tennessee, Shelby County. Our partnership there, Seeding Success, had been doing a lot of work uh, around the historical uh, eviction data and the contribution to the poor education outcomes there when you look at housing stability. And so now they're using that data to look at how are they partnering to uh, get more access to to uh, local and state dollars to support more equitable housing policies. Because again, these, these systems, as you asked about in the early stage, they're not, inter they're, they're more, inter they've always been interdependent, but now in a crisis, we just see that interdependence so much more clearly. Yeah, that's great. Uh, right, like, and, and um, it also seems like that systems, in some cases, if they're not doing something like a Strive Together partnership, um, can just sort of shrug, shrug something off as an externality, right? Like you've got it, everything has to be internal to the system you're trying to solve. So it's just, it's, this is like so typical, but where a school will just shrug off and be like, we can't control everything, right? Like we can only control what happens while they're here or, you know, like that type of mindset. Yeah. yeah. Yes. 
And I, that's what happens in a crisis. I think that's another piece. I mean, that happens all the time, I should say that, but especially in a crisis. And I think we can, we can all understand how overwhelmed our school systems are right now. I think of my own three children and, and quickly the district made a decision one day to go to online and then by Monday teachers were teaching online. And so the sort of figuring out all of all of that, and I'm, I'm hearing this from some of our partnerships and communities um, concerned about how do we not overwhelm uh, the district. The district doesn't want to hear from me right now because um, they're overwhelmed as is. Or um, similar, very. I mean, obviously, our healthcare systems are completely overwhelmed in this crisis. Um, but so I think the role that uh, these cradle to career partnerships can play in lifting up, and this gets to really. Um, sort of what, what we'll do differently this time as we build, um, as we work through recovery, because we've, we've been through crises before as a country, and clearly we have not built um, neither resilient nor equitable systems. And so really uh, giving voice and um, to, to residents, to community in a different way. And so what we've been helping our partnerships to think about is how do you, the system is going to isolate itself. It's going to make decisions. It's going to respond immediately. How do you bring community voice into these conversations and really um, uh, ensure that they're authorized to be informing the solutions this time? And so it is about storytelling, lifting up these examples, bringing the data, um, and, and talking about what needs to be different. If we do agree, which I do think a, a greater part of the country agrees that we cannot go back to uh, the status quo and back to where we were. I love it. And we're going to open this up, Selena, if you could tee up a question or two, but I just, I want to riff off what you're saying, Jennifer. So earlier this week, uh, last week, we were doing um, the interviews for season three of our podcast and uh, I'm going to do a total spoiler alert, but we interviewed LaShawn Rute Chapman and Kathleen Osta with the National Equity Project. Mm -hmm. And they were um, talking about what Gino Francesco calls rebel leadership. Have you heard about that at all? Or it's in some hidden yeah. brain podcast that I'm going to listen to today. But, uh, um, but basically they were saying is leaders don't have to come up with all the answers by themselves. They need to stand in the unknown, create a container for, the un for people to solve their own problems, knowing that it will require leaders to be humble and vulnerable and acknowledge, I don't know the answer, and to be really not just vulnerable and but also really strong and say yes Becky and Jennifer and Selena I hear your concerns and you have privilege coming out of your ears and so I'm actually I appreciate you sharing that and I'm gonna I am I am making the conscious decision to um, give more uh, weight to some other voices in the room we haven't heard from right now which just takes you know all kinds of moral courage to do that right um, so uh, it's like, I guess I'm feeling envious of communities that already have all these people around the table. It sounds like you're encouraging those people to open up, open up their table to really include the community even more. Yeah, yeah no, we, we absolutely are. And I will say this, I mean, having been in this work, uh, since, uh, the beginning of the collective impact, uh, uh, sort of movement, I, I think, and this has been written about and talked about, I mean, where we got our start in this work was very much with the systems leaders at the top, uh, leaders feeling that they could make systems change. And if we brought the systems leaders together, um, that, that we, could, we could figure this out. And, and we've learned certainly and evolved into this type of, of which is, is not a comfortable place for a, a systems leader to be or, a, or an elected official to be, is ceding power to community. And, and that is really how you create more equitable systems. And so we've certainly evolved our approach and our coaching and our, together with our network and learned a tremendous amount um, from network members on the ground, it really thinking differently, like look what happens when we do share power and seed power to community and the creative the creative um, solutions that we can uh, build and so I, I will also listen to that uh, um, podcast I what you said made me think about um, I was listening in on a 
a webinar last week that had Brene Brown and she was talking about resiliency and leadership and if anybody who's read or listened to Brene and uh, loves her as much as I do, uh, you know, know that she talks a lot about vulnerability uh, in leadership and vulnerability being the key to innovation and creativity. And so right now, where and it sounds like um, that's sort of what uh, this rebel leadership idea is, because it's it takes courage to to give up your power and to share your power. And um, but the most creative, uh, innovative solutions um, can come out of that. And I that's clearly what we need right now to get get through the other side of, of this uh, pandemic. Yeah. Um, well, I love it. I love all the ways that, that you and Strive have evolved too. I think it's exciting. It's exciting to share. And I love Brene Brown. Oh my God. Um, so I saw someone wrote in, what's the name of that podcast, the Hidden Brain podcast. And Jennifer, if you can think of the one, the podcast where you heard or the webinar where you heard um, oh, Brene yeah. Brown. Yes. Yeah. yeah, definitely. Um, yeah, yes, it was, um, I will, I will follow up with it. I, I think, um, so it was like a Salesforce webinar, um, that I, I just happened to get an invite to and it was incredible, but I know it's going to be recorded and shared. So I will share it. And okay. it's, yeah. yeah great. Definitely. Great. As we were, I saw some questions. This is being recorded and we're happy to share this too. So, um, Selena, um, I want to, you're on mute, but I want to, uh, uh, give you give you the mic and uh, can let's let's take a I have a few more questions yeah. for Jennifer later but let's hear a few questions from people listening in. Yeah, I wanted to ask the question that Pierce um, asked that's related to what Masha asked in the Q and A, which is related to how do you herd all these systems together and get the community to work together? Like how what's your even process of doing yeah. that? <laughs> yes. Yeah. So um, it's certainly not easy. And we always say it's not as uh, easy as it makes it uh, sound in the, that Stanford uh, Social Innovation Review article uh, written so many years ago. I, I mean, I think it's a lot of failing forward. Um, uh, and, and so I mentioned that we're... Um, we have a couple superpowers that we like to talk about in the Strive Together Network, and these all really emerge. Our theory of action, which guides all of our work, and now I'm getting a little wonky and using the jargon, which Be Becky told me not to do at the beginning, but you can find our theory of action on our website, and we have lots of examples that explain how this works, um, but really it's built together with the network, and there are tools, including using data to drive improvement, and so, um, what, what we've really learned, and we've learned this from uh, uh, really uh, the business sector who embraced continuous quality improvement, and certainly the healthcare sector who has embraced um, quality improvement uh, even more uh, earlier than the social sector, is that uh, when we use tools like holding, keeping results at the center, keeping data at the center, and you bring stakeholders together around a shared vision um, and using that data, you can um, uh, get systems uh, leaders to agree on improvement and change. It is not easy, and there you have to always think politically. Um, I, we borrow a lot of tools. We're actually uh, trained um, uh, by the Annie Casey Foundation in their results count leadership, and so a lot of the tools that I'm speaking about, including holding results at the center, um, centering racial equity in our work, using data, um, using self as an instrument of change, um, uh, new, being holding neutral, being the neutral convener and facilitator, these are all results count tools that we bring into the work that we do with communities to coach them around uh, systems leaders. So our process, just to kind of sum that up, because I know that was a lot, our process is guided by our theory of action, which you can find on, is on our website. And then um, we really have a, a, what we call our collaborative improvement methodology that is a combination of continuous quality improvement results count, uh, centering equity, and then human-centered design. And I mentioned the evolution of Strive Together's approach to really engage community in the work, and that, that human-centered de design or co-development of solutions has been a, a game changer for how we think about our work with different stakeholders in a community. I wanna jump right in with another idea. So if people, so Selena and I live in a relatively small media, like 35,000 size town called Claremont. And there's nothing like, like this here, like what you talk about, like a multi-sector business yeah. education, you know, government nonprofits together around a shared as I know of. Um, 
again, another, we interviewed folks at Cincinnati Children's and Cradle Cincinnati yeah. um, for season four also. And um, uh, uh, I just got a reminder to take out the trash. I will take out the trash. Sorry about <laughs> that. Uh, and um, so doc, uh, uh, Meredith Shockley Smith is uh, a community leader. She's been organizing African-American women um, uh, and they've had a stunning reduction in infant mortality, right? Um, mm -hmm. And in the course of interviewing her for the job and us for the podcast, we realized she did this thing called family dinner where every Wednesday night, I'm talking years, it was a potluck at her house. And she said over the years, over 700 people came to potluck and it was anybody could come, anybody can bring anybody. She, I don't, I, I, and I heard that and I was so inspired um, and, and my, my, my wife and I, we, like, we're like, okay, as soon as it's safe, we're doing family dinner. We're, we're picking up what Meredith did. Like, is there, have you seen something about breaking bread also about, like, that could be the, my, my sense is if you're early on in this, that that could become like the, the thing that snowballs into something that you're talking about here. Maybe, maybe. Yeah. No, absolutely. So, um, you know, Becky, before we jumped on, and I don't, I don't think we were being recorded yet, and I don't think there was anybody really on, but you asked me to talk more about the Weave movement out of Aspen, um, and uh, which I've been, you know, a peripheral part of and been really learning a lot from that. And I, so the idea of breaking bread and bringing community together uh, is really, I met amazing people. There were many organizations. They're, all their names are going to escape me right now, um, <laughs> but I will, I can follow follow up with them, but who are really helping people do exactly what she was doing, thinking about how do you bring different people together, um, break bread, have meals, and talk about your vision for the community. And I think, um, you know, we're seeing more, uh, again, this goes back to, this isn't where the work of, of collective impact necessarily got its start, but it certainly is where, how we're evolving the approaching community, uh, because we're relationships are the most important piece of this work. I mean, results, we talk a lot about results and data, and this is our first sort of uh, decade, and we haven't abandoned data or, or results being at the core of the work, but relationships and, and authentic, building authentic relationships with community and engaging in, them in the work is an important piece of, of, of how you build the trust to be able to really shift those systems. Because I, I haven't been able to follow all the chat, but I did see that, you know, there's some questions like, how do you move elephants in system elephants? And it is, it's not easy, but if you have a mobilized group, and Cincinnati is a great example of that. I mean, the preschool promise, their early childhood work, um, uh, in Cincinnati, which is Cradle Cincinnati is very much connected and the pre preschool promise work has done an incredible job of mobilizing families to advocate for policy change. And, um, and so I think um, parents, residents, families uh, advocating for policy change, advocating for better uh, health care, child care um, for, for children and families in, in the community. And so I, I do think that that's an important uh, method to, to getting this work done. You know, um, Cincinnati really is this uh, cauldron of creativity around system change. And um, I will, Selena, I'll turn it back to you in a second, but I just want to, um, I don't know if I've ever told you this, Jennifer, but I'm in third grade, my family moved from Phoenix, Arizona to Cincinnati. I was only there for third grade. I went to All Saints, mm -hmm. uh, little Catholic yeah. school. Yeah. And uh, for a whole year, I was the new kid and I was Becky the Bucktooth Beaver. Uh, <laughs> Oh, I just remembered another one. My last name, my maiden name was Canis. Um, and so someone brilliantly, third grader, figured out that Canis is Latin for dog. So I was canine Canis, oh a God. dog too. So I have been in the bitter barn about Cincinnati. <laughs> <laughs> Understandably so, Becky. <laughs> 51 minus, yeah. what are you in eighth grade or third grade? Eight, you know, that many years. And I'm, I'm willing to let it go because you, you all are doing such great strides. Um, and uh, um, I really haven't, I've only flown through there once. And I did make a point to get some Skyline chili, a chili dog, uh, because I do have good memories of that. Um, but, but truly, like, I'm, I'm so impressed with the stuff that's happening there. All oh. right, Selena. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead, Jennifer. Yeah, I was just going to say, we would love to welcome you back uh, <laughs> to Cincinnati and, and come. So you're, once, once we're able to travel again and visit one another cities, you're definitely coming to Cincinnati. Totally, totally. I'll just be like, I hope the people don't call me back we'll to avoid, fear. avoid, avoid yeah, all yeah. saints. Yeah, well. yeah, our canine canis. Yeah. All right, Selena, what other questions are we getting from folks in the chat or in the Q&A? Um, I love the question. I'm going to combine Robin and Itai's question too about 
power um, and leadership and how you give the power over to either Gen Z or the people who are are the ones that we're trying to impact because I think oftentimes power is so much from the top down. So I think the, the issue of power is big for people and talking about systems change. Yeah, no. Um, uh, so this is, this is a big issue and it has, it has been a big evolution of, of I, as I said, collective impact. And I think the systems change work. And so um, some examples that we're seeing, I, I think I always go back to the examples from the network. And um, one example that comes to mind immediately, especially through this recovery, um, is the UP partnership, which is in San Antonio, uh, Bear County, uh, Texas. And um, they have created essentially an equitable recovery pledge that really where they're asking systems leaders, partners in the community to sign on to this pledge that, uh, that in, in it, it includes uh, tenants of sharing power with community in making decisions, um, in making policy. So if we think of systems change as really policy change, and we know that a lot of policy development is, hap is going to happen right now at the local, state, and federal level, um, how do we ensure that uh, we're sharing power and, and ceding power to community to develop policy? And, and that gets to things like this, this equitable recovery pledge, this, um, which is, yeah, it's a piece of paper, but it's if you have your local policymakers signing on, your partners signing on, on how you're going to uh, engage and authorize residents and community to really make decisions and young people. Um, Up, Up Partnership is a, is a great example of, of engaging young people in, um, in policy work. Even prior to COVID, they established uh, the Our Generation Network, which is a network of young people who are really helping to shape policy decisions and so they're already mobilized these young people are already mobilized to be able to contribute and and be involved in the policy response that will come and um, the other just really quick shout out that I if you haven't had a chance to look at um, policy link put together um, the a, a set of principles for a common sense street smart recovery and really what they're talking about in this set of principles and and obviously again um, policy is being made so quickly right now and we saw what happened with the cares act we see the inequities coming out of some of these policies that are being done being created so quickly um i think if we can hold on to the principles that policy link has identified um in what it would look like to have a i love the idea of a street smart recovery how do you engage those who have lived experience in policy making and policy creating and that's for us as systems leaders to cede our, our power uh, to those who are most affected by the policies that we create. Awesome, thank you. Um, I, that reminded me of our National Equity Project um, season three podcast episode where it really was about leading with your values. Like even if we don't know what the end of this crisis is gonna be, like if your value is engaging the youth, engaging the parents in the decision, not to feel like you have to have the answer, but if my value and the outcome I want is to engage students and families in the decision-making, at least we lead from there and we will find the answer. So I really related that to what you just said. Um, John has a great question about um, a pattern that they're seeing across partners are those who have navigated the current crisis most effectively are those who have had the to weather previous crises, which forced cross-system collaboration. For example, Sonoma County with the wildfires and Florida around hurricane response. And are you sim seeing similar patterns? Uh, yes, definitely. Um, definitely we're seeing uh, patterns um, uh, like that across the network. And this gets back to what we were talking about earlier related to uh, the idea of a network effect. Uh, once, right, very soon after this crisis uh, started, we created, we have a, a portal where all of our network members share information, resources, things like this, uh, the equitable recovery pledge that I mentioned. Um, 
these are places where you can share examples and learn from one another. And so what we're seeing in the in our COVID-19 sort of portal uh, space is the sharing of, of best practices, uh, similar things. Uh, we have a number of partnerships in California who have experienced uh, wildfires. Um, there are other uh, uh, partnerships who have had a, a long-standing sort of cross-sector collaboration um, uh, DNA in their community. So I think of, of Rocky Mountain Cradle to Career. They actually started in a much different way out of law enforcement. So we're talking about most our partnerships being grounded in education, but this had been a federal grant um, that was uh, actually started with the local law enforcement. So there's already that natural um, drive towards uh, towards really working cross se cross sectors and cross systems. And and they are they've had a very coordinated response and they've been able to um, be a very effective in their communication about the response. So I see that as an example we've been able to share across the network uh, with others who want to think about coordinating their own response and how to get in, into um, uh, alignment with other systems in, in, in their community. Great. And then I'm going to combine the first three questions that we got because they were all related to education. So one is how does how much does Strive Together focus on social emotional learning and how is that measured? How, how since COVID-19 are we focused on remote and online learning with black and brown kids and how can we get that information? And has uh, Strive Together looked at publicly funded Montessori programs that are transforming communities in East Dallas or Hartford, Connecticut or St. Louis? I know that's a lot of questions, but that was a lot. I know I got, the, I got the first one on SEL and then the Montessori. I'm sorry, Selena, can you repeat the middle one so I make sure that sure. I Sure. Uh, since COVID-19, what work has been happening around black and brown kids with remote oh. and online learning? Got it. Online. Okay. All right, so I'm going to start with uh, social emotional learning. Um, yes, certainly our Strive Together partnerships are um, really looking at how do you uh, address student social emotional learning and working with a number of partners in the community who are who are working to support uh, students' uh, social emotional learning. The challenge is, and, and I think this was the second part of the question, is how do you measure it? Um, and I I think we as a network have been um, hopeful that there'll be more consistent and uh, reliable ways of measuring uh, social emotional learning. I always point to a great example out of New York called the Student Success Network. They have developed uh, an assessment where a number of, of local partners and um, uh, school in New York City public schools and other partners have agreed on a common assessment for how to look at how you're assessing social emotional learning. Um, that has been a challenge. Um, uh, there are certainly a lot of people, uh, researchers doing work around SEL and, and really naming competencies. And I'm going to say, I wish that they would spend more time on figuring out how to help us measure competencies so that we can uh, uh, begin to uh, work on this in a more consistent way. Um, but uh, but it, is, it is important. And I, I will share um, an example. I believe I, it was our partnership Bridge to Success in, in Waterbury, Connecticut, um, when I was uh, having a conversation with them, um, I think uh, one of the key focuses for them at that time was really how do you support students SEL right now and even connecting young people with one another during this time when they're so disconnected. And I've seen this with my own three children and particularly my 12 year old daughter who is, you know, you're, you're completely, and in, in, again, we're talking about someone with tremendous a lot of privilege and all of the resources and here I am working out of my home I'm here with her all the time and she is struggling uh, because her world has been upended and so when I think about the children and, and mental health and and social emotional learning and social emotional needs right now are more uh, prominent than ever and and it's going to be a, an area where we need to focus in our schools and in our communities and um, I know in a bridge to success in water they were organizing Zoom calls. We gave Zoom licenses to all of our partnerships right away so that they could connect with their partners. And I loved that they were um, organizing Zoom conversations with young people in the area just to support one another and that sort of peer support and making sure that there was a sense of belonging and a sense of connection during this time. 
Um, and then um, related to online learning and certainly children of color experiencing um, uh, the digital the digital divide by far of, of all of the um, conversations that uh, we've had with our network members, it's consistently comes up that uh, the stark uh, uh, digital divide in communities, um, essentially communities right next to one another, but you could clearly see, um, you know, uh, the the differences in the communities where you would have even a even within a. A, a singular school district having access to internet in some spaces and um, not in other spaces and just further uh, widening the gaps experienced experience, uh, that are experienced by children. So we've heard about creative uh, stopgap solutions about um, school buses providing hotspots. We've heard stories from network members who, um, who where their the principals of schools have said oh, there were a group of, of kids gathered outside the school to try and get internet access from the school, um, so so their children and families are, are going um, to the schools to get get the internet access that's there. But these are, I think, what and this gets back to really transforming and creating more equitable systems. These are all uh, stopgap solutions into a much larger problem. In that there is no reason why we cannot provide more equitable broadband internet access um, to communities across the country. It does little. I've, I'm, you know, while I'm impressed that some uh, cable companies, including the one in my community, have have offered uh, free internet to to people. If you don't have the infrastructure, if you don't have the technology or devices, if you don't have stable housing. Um, where you are, you cannot get that access to uh, to internet. So this is again a multi-sector, multi-system uh, problem that needs to be addressed with some more equitable and inclusive policies. Um, that seems to be a no-brainer that this country can do, and it needs to happen at the local, state, and national level um, in coordinating policies around around uh, uh, if online learning is going to need to continue, which um, we, we believe that it will for some time, and, and knowing that we can do it and we can deliver it, we have to be able to provide the infrastructure to do that. And then last, on the question as it relates to um, the public funded uh, Montessori, that is not something, so um, that's not something that I, uh, that Strive Together has, has spent uh, any time on. Perhaps our local uh, partnerships in those communities certainly have, um, but when it comes to, um, although we measure our, we, we do measure indicators within those seven out, cradle to career outcome areas that are education focused, uh, we are really multi-system, multi-sector, not education experts. Um, our partnerships and communities certainly are and might be able to uh, answer that question. Great, thank you. Um, Sarah has a great question here about, um, she says, I've been reading Glennon Doyle's new book, Untamed. She suggests that change starts with imagination and asking the question, what is the most true and perfect situation you can imagine? I'm curious what you can imagine the most true and perfect recovery you can imagine in the midst of this crisis. Oh, that is a great question. Oh, um, so uh, that is, that's an amazing question. I mean, I think the, the best and uh, imaginable recovery is really a set of integrated policies and systems um, that fundamentally look different than how we operate today at the local, uh, state, and and federal level. I mean, when you think about how policies are created, um, you have these different and disparate systems like education and health and human human services, healthcare sector, um, transportation, and these systems do not talk to one another. You know, I would look. I would. I want to imagine a world where our partnerships. Um, I mean, I love the work that we do, but I think all of our partnerships want to imagine a world where they're not necessary. But this would mean, this would require, uh, you know, just working much, much differently uh, from a system standpoint. And, and I do believe that that looks like more integrated and equitable policies um, in this country. And, and when you think about the, this country's long history of, 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 policies that oppress uh, certain populations, especially uh, uh, children and families of color and those experiencing poverty, this is going to mean a, just a really different way of imagining this, this country and, and how it operates. And so 
I do, um, I think it is on, on us to really, uh, those of us who are systems leaders who are thinking about how do you change systems and how do you engage people in that change in a, in a much different way than we have before to get to that vision of, of an integrated and supportive um, community. And so I, it goes back to our purpose, which is a place where every child, regardless of race, uh, ethnicity, uh, zip code or circumstance has every opportunity to thrive and reach their full potential. I mean, that is, is the vision. And I, I believe that we all share that vision, but it is clear that um, in the way that we develop policy in this country for hundreds and hundreds of years that we don't. So what's it gonna take for us to, to really uh, create an opportunity like that in this country going forward? Oh, Selena, I think you're on mute. Oh, great, okay. I'm back, hopefully. Um, I'm going to try and combine another couple of questions because I know that we are getting short on time. I do want to try and fit these together in some way. But uh, one of the things you talked about was data. So I wanted to throw in Jonathan's question about, are there data gaps that are being created by the social distancing? And Rhonda's also asked a question about summer learning loss and all of these things like, are we still able, as Strive Together, still able to collect data given that there's social distancing and uh, do we really know what's happening with kids? And Damien asked, what are the top three concerns that you would say are bubbling to the surface for underserved communities? Yep. So, um, all right, those are a lot of, I'm just jotting these down. So on data, um, we are, so, you know, if I, if you think of there are opportunities in every crisis. Um, I, you know, we will we'll have we'll lose a lot of the data that had been readily available and that our network members relied on, which is administrative testing data. No schools are are um, doing test, uh, you know, testing this year. So, um, and when we talk to to uh, our partnerships and communities, you know, they talk about okay, we'll assess. Um, uh, where students are in the fall and we'll work to catch them up. But if we're realistic, I mean, there were huge gaps in uh, learning prior to COVID. And now the, the inequities that are being created that we've discussed with uh, the digital divide and, and who's getting, who has online learning with both parents um, in the house to supervise them like my kids do versus um, the majority of, of, uh, of people who do not have that who, who are children of essential workers and others who are not home to supervise their learning. So those are huge gaps and we will be missing um, data. And so what we've been, but what we had been talking about getting to the opportunity in this crisis and even pre-COVID, we have been talking about the reliance um, uh, on this type of administrative testing data that we know can be uh, biased, um, is not the most effective data, is not the only data that we can collect. And um, our network of, of communities had been pushing us to look at what are some of the systems indicators that we should be measuring uh, that, that many communities are tracking, but like, how do we really look at what are uh, what are systems indicators? Knowing that um, just because a child isn't reading it, or a, if a child's not reading at grade level, it's not necessarily because they haven't had effective liter teachers. Um, that might be one factor, but there are multiple factors contributing to that. So how are we collecting the data? And I, I do want to make sure I I've, I've never ever I I. That was just one example. I'm always careful when I say anything about teachers. One example of one indicator, and I know everyone on this call knows that I'm not um, saying that a teacher is responsible, but there are multiple indicators that go into whether or not a child is, is reading at grade level. And not having that grade level assessment is going to force us to do a better job of collecting and measuring some of these systems indicators that frankly we should have been measuring for a while. So um, it's, not gonna, it's not going to be easy. We're gonna have to look at um, how do we become better trained to collect qualitative data? Um, how do we use tools that are available like Tableau um, and uh, other tools to really visualize data and help people understand different types of data? Um, but there is still data available. It, it does have an impact on, on um, how our partnerships do their work. We've, a number of our partnerships create predictive models um, to get out ahead of challenges and so are worried about the accuracy of data in, in, um, 
in that, but um, I think uh, that uh, we'll be able to work through this and it gets back to that uh, uh, being creative, uh, rebel leadership, uh, being really vulnerable and not having what we're used to and be, being able to become creative and innovative coming out of that. Um, and then I think, Selena, the other piece to that question was related to the top three concerns um, coming out of, of our communities. I think um, number one is that uh, if we don't do enough to center racial and ethnic equity in, in creating a, a more equitable recovery, then uh, there, there's huge concern in that because policy gets uh, created and developed so quickly um, that the concern, and I know we, we obviously talked a little bit about this, there is a concern that community voices and especially voices of those who have been most marginalized by systems won't be included in, in really that policy development. So that is a huge concern for network members. There's, there are concerns about, as I mentioned, um, more you know, tactically like around the digital divide, around what's gonna happen. Um, uh, summer learning loss was something that you um, asked about as well that I know I didn't address this piece of what will happen when summer, you won't have uh, summer school, you won't have summer camps, sort of what will happen uh, to those children and how, um, going back to Partners for Education that I mentioned, um, uh, out of Berea, you know, they know, uh, I was talking with Dreama about this, and she knows that they, they are going to have to connect to kids over the summer. And so finding ways to uh, find adults who can make those connections um, and make sure that they're paying attention to who are the children most at need, most at risk throughout the summer, making connections with them, however that's able to be done during social distancing. Um, so, so the concern is around learning loss is, is another one of those uh, concerns. And then, I mean, I feel like I've talked, I've been a broken record about just policy, just policy change uh, needing to uh, be more equitable through this recovery. So I know we're running out of time and I've, I've been all over the place, so I'll pause. <laughs> No, this is great. And actually, um, I think Selena and I have been chatting to make sure Lucy's question gets answered. And I think that <laughs> Lucy's is a good tee up into what I wanted to ask. And um, first of all, Jennifer, I really want to appreciate how you are able to pluck from different examples. It's the, the, the knowledge, the, in, the, the institutional knowledge that's in your brain about what's working where and your, your generosity with sharing us there. And uh, I'm imagining when we send this out, we might want to send like hyperlinks to, <laughs> so that people can know each other, right? That that's part of, I want to talk to the person in San Antonio, right? Like, so that that's a big part of it. We'll find a way to support that happening. Um, and I, one of the things you said that I'll, I'll just out as a, a parent of a kindergartner that, that actually scares me is this notion of getting caught up of uh, like, so so in, in our community, um, they made the decision to make school, you know, online learning mandatory and graded. Uh, and their, their reason, they say, we have a moral, a moral imperative to prepare students for next year. And I am just pulling my hair out being like, next year is made up, dude. It's just completely made up. So how about you just teach the kids you get right? Like this is, and um, so anyways, you can see I'm feeling like yeah. kind of pissy about this, but it's just all made up. So I feel like the constructs and these implicit ideas are being revealed that it's more important that a kid be ready for some arbitrary timeline yes. than that the system shaped to the child. And I also want to just uh, throw in, uh, I've been working for years now, we've been working for years with Sonoma County Office of Education and every week multiple times a week students are asked school was so interesting today i wanted to come back tomorrow essentially um, yeah. and and answered on a likert scale and uh i'm talking from like third grade to high school seniors and disaggregated by a, a whole host of demographic factors and they've been working how can we um how can we reshape what we do as a district a school and a classroom um, and supports to the students so i feel like there's this this huge opportunity here of this gets to Lucy's questions and what do we need to dial up and dial down yeah. so that we can really, really not only make the system change, but make those system change more equitable and more just yeah. too. Yeah. yeah. I mean, you, you are hitting on something that's so important. It is, it's kind of figuring out like telling these stories 
of, of what's happening with children. So grading policies come up all the time now because similarly, I mean, my, my kids, it's graded um, and I'm thinking, how is this at all equitable? Why is this okay? And so if we're not, if me, like if I'm not asking the question and, and I am uh, to much to the dismay of, I happen to be on a committee of my daughter's school and it's probably, you know, it's just like, why, why would we do this? Why would we not shape exactly what you're saying, shape learning that's adapted to children's needs at this time? And I keep thinking what something what you were saying, and I'm sure many people have seen this, but I thought it was one of the most poignant things that I've read during all of this is this, um, it was a medium blog on um, the gaslighting that will happen, like to make us forget, like to make us go back to everything is, is fine, everything's normal, like that didn't happen, this didn't happen. Yeah. And th when I think of that, it makes me wanna scream. I'm thinking, how can we have to remember this happened and we have to know that we can be better, we can be a better, more equitable society. I, I, it's hard to like, when you look at what's going on in, in government to, to think that that's possible. But if, if we believe that, if we as system, those who are, who are helping support communities uh, do systems work, and if communities believe that, I believe that it can be done. And so that's what I'm holding hope uh, uh, on for all of this. And um, it was just so great to be with you today, Becky. And, and thank you yes. for that. <laughs> yes, so. yes. And I'm hearing, hold on to your truth, question yes. everything, yeah. question everything. Yeah. And just like, think about kids being like, hurry up, catch up. They already rush them enough as it is, you know, right? Yeah. Like, like th put yourself in the position of, um, of the, the person really, right? Like be, and, and, and seed power, open it up stay curious that these have been themes throughout. And so I saw Lucy just shared the medium yes. uh, the, uh, gaslighting piece in the chat. Yeah. Thank you, Lucy. And um, Jennifer, thank you so, so much. Uh, this has been so educational and such a gift. Thank you. Thank you. And, and may all your good work and the work of all your partnerships uh, continue and thrive. And uh, really, I, I'd love, uh, maybe we can do a follow-up one, yeah. like say six months from now. Uh, that'd be awesome. Would love to do that. Thank you so much. Thanks for being Yeah. And thank you for everyone who was listening. And yeah. uh, I want to throw a poll up too and say like, do you want more stuff like this? I think, uh, let's see if we can, uh, uh, if, if you want more, let us know. Um, and uh, we can, we can create more things like this. So thank you all for joining us. Thank you. Thank you. We'll send a recording out soon. I should have put the poll up sooner, but we'll just, Maybe we could tell a joke while we're <laughs> giving people time to do the poll and uh, go back to go back to their busy, busy work. Um, Jennifer, um, thank you. Thank oh you. My thank gosh. you. Thank you, Becky. No, this was great. There. Yeah, it's so awesome to be able to share. Um, so there were many examples that I was like, ah, I forgot that one. I forgot that one. But we just people are doing really incredible things. So thanks for the opportunity to be able to share that. Oh yeah. Yeah. And you're just like, Oh, here they're doing this. They're yeah. doing that. And, and uh, I mean, meanwhile, we would just love to get one of these started in our community, you know, and, and even the work in Sonoma, which I think is beautiful. It's yeah. just, it is, it's being funded by different sectors. And so that's, there's that level of engagement and they're all going to come to the next Friday is the, what do we learn session? Yeah. But it's, but, but I, you got me thinking maybe the next iteration is actually that those others, stakeholders in the room as we're facing into the data too, you know, so. Yes, great. definitely. Well, and I see we have 100% of people would like more webinars like this. So <laughs> All right, uh, good. A plus for Jennifer mm -hmm. and Strive. Well. And uh, that's great. So thank you so much. And um, yeah. thank you all. all right. And please give my best to everyone Thanks. there. I will. I will. You do the same. Yeah. Tell Christine I said hi. Thank you, Selena. I will. I'm going to go give her a great big hug and her. Yes. She's homeschooling in the mornings and I, and, and I, the B team takes over in the afternoons. Yes. And it's not pretty. <laughs> I'm right there with you. My husband's do, like, luckily it, oh, it's just a mess. I'm, yeah. When I have to do it, it's, it's a mess. So, yeah. I'm like, so it's bad. It's not pretty. Uh, All right. Well, all right. Take care. Okay. Bye. Bye. Guys. All right. Bye. Bye. bye.